All right. So Dugin was often featured in Red Star, and this is the official newspaper of the Russian Ministry of Defense. So there's no way that uh, this decision was made without uh, approval from higher up. Right. So, you know, the Red Star, it's, it's, it's sort of like uh, it's sort of like Stars and Stripes. It's a, it's a very big, very important newspaper. So in one of his most striking articles, he puts forward this really fascist inspired de definition of being an officer. Um, so he argues the officer class in the Indo-European world was descended from the Kshatriya caste in ancient India. He sort of discreetly avoids the use of the term Aryan, but the, the interviewer brought it up. Um, and this definition of the ideal warrior included a lot of fascist references. So it's saying the true warrior has to have attention to the spiritual advice of the priests, the Brahmin, a belief in tradition and submission before principles which are created and interpreted by the priests. And of course, Dugan here is the priest. Uh, tradition, uh, that's something that comes up a lot in um, neo-Nazi and far-right and fascist kind of thought. It, it includes various occultist kind of things. And his larger argument in this article is that um, Russian warriors, that is to say the Russian officer class, are actual descendants of the Aryans who uh, came and settled Russia. And there are other places where he writes about the uh, Aryan origin of the Russian people. Uh, and, um, you know, La Ruelle actually talks about that in various places. So, so this is quite striking. I mean, even somebody who's not particularly looking for fascism in this article, I think would would be struck by the fascist aspects of it. So in this later article, he again is emphasizing the importance of the officer class, right? So the army is a, a guarantor of the country's sovereignty. Uh, it's not just military and police functions, but also state formation and elite formation. As a matter of fact, genesis of elites is a business of the army, right? So that emphasis on the elite is very important here. Uh, he's not that interested in what the rank and file soldier thinks, but what the elite uh, thinks. And we see this in other places as well. So 2008, he becomes an adjunct in the right wing sociology department of Moscow State University. And we see him less in the um, newspapers and uh, other defense publications, right? Even off by this time is also not, um, not defense minister. So he's publishing textbooks. And by the way, I would argue that that is an example of um, influence because he would publish these textbooks like one a year and they, they were used pretty widely, um, you know, not just about geopolitics, but also about the meaning of war uh, and war as a means to uh, cleanse the organism, um, all sorts of different things. And, uh, you know, in other places, he, he lays out a whole program to uh, infiltrate the American uh, internet and uh, social media. Uh, you know, he, he does put together quite a bit of material having to do with, um, you know, undermining the U.S. in various different ways. So this time comes to an end when he on YouTube says, uh, kill, kill, kill Ukrainians, right? Uh, he later said that that was just a joke, but obviously, you know, uh, I, I think that we can all agree that it isn't. Um, and by the way, that's also very typical of fascism. So to say, oh, oh, I said that, but now I'm not saying that. Remember that A, but not A. Uh, here we see that again. So his star during this time uh, is in decline in terms of his influence on the military per se. But Putin had chosen a different fascist thinker as a guide. And that is even Ilyan. Um, Ilyan is somebody who Putin had become acquainted with before, right? At least by 2005, he would have been acquainted uh, with him. Uh, Nikita Mikhalkov, the director who did Burnt by the Sun and, and other famous movies, he had actually been the one to uh, tell Putin about Ilium. Um, 
so Ilan was a Russian fascist in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he had these three main aspects. He celebrated will and violence rather than reason and law. Uh, there was a leader with a mystical connection to his people. That was a big aspect of his thinking. And then you have globalization as a conspiracy uh, rather than something that's happening in, in the kind of reality, shall we say. So these are the aspects of his thought. And Putin does a lot. I mean, Putin cites Ilan in his speeches. He uh, sends civil servants a complete set of Ilan's works. Right, so this is that classic thing of you produce the entire body of work in a multi-volume set, and so he actually sent that around to different civil servants. Uh, so there were a lot of things that that Putin definitely did and said that showed that Putin, that uh, Ilan was this very important person for him. Okay, so here are some quotes: uh, "Evil begins where the person begins." Uh, Ukrainians for him, referred to only in quotation marks. This is Ilan again. Um, and, uh, you know, he writes, the fact of the matter is that fascism is a redemptive excess of patriotic arbitrariness. So that's that glorification of violence that we see in other uh, aspects of fascism. Uh, he also sees World War II as the struggle of civilizations. And so he writes a lot about the different, you know, types of civilizations. So in 2011, 2012, um, what was Putin dealing with? He had more or less rigged an election so that he would be reelected. There were a lot of protests against that. And his response to these protests was to go um, down this path of Ilan and uh, emphasizing this, this different way of, of doing things. And we see this change in major documents. So 2013 foreign policy document, for the first time in modern history, global competition takes place on a civilizational level, right? And that could be un understood in a lot of different ways. But, you know, when we're looking at this idea of civilization um, as seen through Ilan, it starts to make a bit more sense. Um, and then, the military doctrine. Uh, this is actually a pretty big change from the original, from the earlier one. Um, you see, it's not just military force, right? So military conflict is not just military force, but also political, economic information and other measures of non-military nature through the extensive use of the population's protest potential and special operations forces. So, you know, uh, War is not just armed force. So this is especially relevant now when um, Putin has been saying that sanctions are like economic war. Uh, according to this doctrine, that would mean it is actually a war. And this, this uh, book, Oscar Johnson, The Russian Understanding of War, it's just a tremendously important book. And uh, if, if everybody could read it, if all Americans could read it, I think it, it would be a great thing because it really, it really does go into these details. So we see this shift. We see this big shift. Um, now, I mean, can I prove that this shift is because of, of this decision to kind of go down this road of, of uh, following Ilan? It's, it's difficult, but at the same time, it's telling that we have these shifts that are taking place. And these are not the only ones. You have this new idea um, that there should be this, you know, uh, Eurasian expansionism. Um, so instead of Russia versus the EU, um, Putin talks about creating a harmonious society from Lisbon, Lisbon to Vladivostok. Uh, free trade zone, even more advanced mechanisms of economic integration. So this is part of his larger plans for a Eurasian Union. There's also this idea of a Eurasian Customs Union, um, and this was to combat the EU. But I, I want you to pay particular attention to this idea of Lisbon to Vladivostok, uh, because that's a particular kind of imaginary. Um, and here we have a similar kind of idea in Dugan's Foundations 420, uh, Eurasian North. It is indeed from Lisbon to Vladivostok. Now, 
can this 100% prove that there is this influence on Putin? No. Uh, I mean, it is telling, it is interesting. Um, you know, LaRuel argues, well, these things don't, uh, you can't prove that this has influenced Putin. Putin never physically met with uh, Dugan, um, you know, and we can't prove that he read it. However, you know, given that Putin has been writing about Eurasian, um, Eurasianism has cited the classical Eurasianists, um, has been talking about a unified Eurasian sphere. It, it seems that the it seems that the coincidences are sort of piling up. If one looks at this and looks at the kind of imaginary of um, Putin's world and says, oh, well, there's no reason to expect these two things uh, have been connected. So again, I think, I think that this, this is uh, telling. And also this influence could have been through the larger uh, military sphere, because Putin is very much surrounded by people in the military. Uh, those people had long connections to Dugan. The textbook was widely used. So this concept might not have directly traveled from Dugan to Putin, but could have traveled via the, the military group that was so uh, influenced by, by Dugan. Right. So Dugan reemerges uh, from his uh, kind of textbook world uh, with this 2014 Russian invasion of Ukraine. So he creates this fascist youth group. It was active in the breakaway regions of Ukraine. Uh, it's sort of a fascist astroturfing. Uh, it's, it's actually a very interesting situation. There are all of these kind of breakaway groups and organizations uh, that are taking part in this. And these uh, fascist groups are part of the uh, people who are actually um, running these breakaway republics. So in response to this invasion, he writes, if you're a traditionalist, change the world, challenge the surrounding filth, democracy, human rights, liberalism, materialism, egalitarian ideas and parties, and erase it from the face of the earth, conquer or die, right? Conquer or die. Um, he's again being quoted in Russian military journals. Um, and this is quite recent, uh, November, 2021. He's saying that, you know, these victories kind of prolong legitimation, but there's a problem because it doesn't solve the absence of ideology. Uh, it doesn't solve the, the need for the state to turn towards the people. Now, of course, the ideology he wants to see is fascism. Uh, but again, we arrive at this insurmountable problem where even though uh, what I'm arguing here is that the the ideology of the elite is indeed fascist. It can't really be made a mass ideology, but there's a problem because you need to have soldiers who are fighting for something. And so all you can do is to charge that others are doing what you yourself uh, believe in. So you have the situation of this gap between the elite and the mass that can't really be brought together by ideology. And you know, we see these things with uh, people talking uh, uh, about as if this is another World War II, right? That is to say from the Russian point of view, but that has to uh, ignore the actual facts on the ground uh, and believe in this kind of you know, Ukrainian uh, fascism, which the rank and file uh, soldiers uh, seem to not be believing given the, the accounts that are coming out of there. So when we, when we start to think about this ideology as an elite ideology, it starts to solve several of the problems that uh, we see going forward in this war in Ukraine. It doesn't solve them in terms of what's happening on the ground, because of course what's happening on the ground is absolutely horrific. Uh, war crimes, uh, you know, there are things that are similar to, to what the Nazis did there, but it helps to explain a range of actions 
and statements that otherwise remain sort of widely separated and hard to bring together in a whole.